What? All right. Oh, yes. Look at that. All sorts of new stuff appeared there. Thank you. I was trying to jump the gun was what was happening. Okay. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, BPF memory model. Um, and uh, what's happening is we have a lot more concurrency within BPF programs, uh, BPF user space, and the rest of the kernel. So there's a motivation to have some way of organizing this. I'm going to go through the first part of this rather quickly. It's a recap of uh, what I presented uh, uh, last spring. Uh, and it's mostly there for completeness. But in any case, uh, this is the agenda we're going through. We're going to be focusing more, most on item six here in this agenda. But uh, memory model, uh, concurrent accesses, I uh, hope you know what data races are. Uh, we have a Linux kernel memory model that is not the C standard. That makes life uh, interesting. And on the bottom of a lot of slides will be little URLs like on this one. And that's uh, where we have LLBN articles and other things uh, that give more detail. Uh, compilers can do all sorts of nasty things to you. Here's a list of them. Uh, and the hardware can do nasty things too. Uh, it's not always straightforward. Uh, and even on x86, we have these issues. So uh, the Linux kernel memory model is what makes sense. BPF interacts very closely with Linux kernel. That's the only real choice. Uh, there is some overhead. Uh, the added overhead in x86 is less than on the weekly ordered uh, machines. But things like atomic operations, uh, shared memory atomic operations are more expensive than simple loads and stores. Uh, the atomics also incur cache misses. So it's not just the memory ordering overhead. All right, uh, the answer to that one is easily no. Here is a partial list of the atomics in the kernel. Uh, we should add them as they're needed. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a lot of helpers. A lot of the concurrency is handled by the helpers. Those are written in Linux kernel code rather than as BPF programs, and they can take up much of the concurrency load. Not all of it, much of it. OK, uh, and uh, here are some that have already been added and some that might be added. Uh, the basic thing is the ones that are most useful, uh, most straightforward, and most needed. OK, so again, an appropriate subset of the Linux kernel memory model. Uh, so how would it work? This is we're getting more towards the parts uh, we want to talk to. I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly because I want to allow time for a discussion. Uh, but at this point, I'm going to start going through a little more carefully. The thing is that we have multiple tools. We want to use the right tool for the job. Uh, there's something called HERD7. This is the original Linux kernel memory model that uh, hit the kernel in 2018. Uh, it requires hand translation to its little litmus tests. It's exact, uh, exhaustive. Uh, KC SAN is uh, dynamic and approximate, but it is very good. Uh, I use it often to find problems in uh, RCU code. Uh, it does require some integration with BPF. We talked about this a little bit uh, last spring, and I'm having a little more detail on it here. Uh, one issue that's still kind of open is handling of user space components. Uh, that we, have, we may have to use some fallbacks for that, but uh, that's hopefully part of the discussion. OK. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail. This is just, a, I, I went through some of the tests um, and made a BCC-based, uh, excuse me, uh, BPF-lib-based uh, build myself. <laughs> and here are some of the translations you would use to hand code it. Again, I'm not going to go through this uh, in detail. Uh, if you're interested, you can talk to me, or for that matter, to Andre, who has uh, worked with us fairly heavily in his uh, ring buffer work uh, last year. OK, and this is just an example of some code that's been simplified that you use as a starting point. This is the corresponding litmus test. Uh, and uh, if you run it, you end up with something like that. And the key thing here is never, which means that the bad condition never happens, the condition being here. So uh, again, uh, if you're really deeply interested in this, which I would encourage, talk to me or talk to Andre, again, who has used this. OK, let's take a look at KCSAN. That's uh, a bit of a newer topic. Uh, there's been thought about uh, LKMM and BPF for a couple of years. KCSAN is uh, more recent, uh, but very useful. Um, and if you want more detail, this URL at the bottom uh, is notes from the meeting back in uh, last spring. And the two LLVN articles are also extremely valuable. They give a good idea of what KCSAN is, what it does, and so on. So what the basic uh, technology behind KC SAN, kernel concurrency sanitizer is, sanitizer, is software watch points. Um, and this is kind of like hardware watch points. So what happens is the software detects 
conflicting accesses to a given variable. And this is used to detect data races. That was the original intent of KCSAN. It's since been augmented. So you can specify what your concurrency design rules are. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, if you have internal C code, uh, BPF helpers, for example, those are already taken care of. KCSAN already works with those. You don't have to do anything. But the JIT code can use the KCSAN public API. This is an example of the API, basically where you do a read or write to a shared variable or something that might be a shared variable. Uh, you emit function calls as given by that pattern. You could call directly call KCSAN check access uh, and that works, but it doesn't give you as good performance. Um, you could make this work with PPF trace too, as far as I know. Uh, again, uh, user space code, uh, the user space components in a BPF program are uh, require special handling and that is still, uh, well, maybe we can discuss that here. Okay, uh, KCSAN can be tailored. Uh, in the main kernel, we have the values chosen for these first three kconfig options, okay? So um, that is, if you just do a plain write, it assumes that's as good as a write once. I'm not on board with that, but there's a lot of people like it, and uh, it's at least a way of getting them to put up with KCSAN, which is a step forward. Um, also, if you have a write that doesn't change the value, KCSAN doesn't complain about that, and um, it doesn't worry about interrupts coming in and making changes. Uh, alternatively, RCU doesn't like those. I don't like those, so I make them strict. And there's a, a Marco gave me a K -f -k config KCSAN strict, which which reverses the sense of these three and also takes care of any other things that might be added later to uh, to soften the memory model. Okay, so you have some control over the types of errors or the types of uh, of races you wish to detect. Uh, and of course. It's going to give you stack addresses. We'll, we'll see a quick look at what it looks like when it gives you the splat in a little bit. Um, and you'll want config debug info equals y and maybe some other things as well. You guys know the tools better than I do uh, to mo more easily uh, trace and uh, the stack traces back to the source code. Okay, uh, this is an example KCSAN splat. Uh, you see a whole pile of equals sign, kind of like locked up. And then you got this bug KCSAN, it says, gives the two functions. In this case, it's the same function in both cases. And this is data race. Uh, and it gives you two, it gives you stack traces and state. And it didn't fit in one slide, so we've got the first one right here. So we have a write. It says the virtual address are wrote to. It says four bytes, task zero on CPU seven. And it gives us a little stack trace. Um, and again, you'd probably want to translate that. I didn't bother here. It says there's no locks held. Um, if you're running locked up, of course, it gives you a bunch of information about what's going on. It gives an IRQ event stamp. In other words, what kind, how many IRQs are there, which can be useful in looking at multiple of them, seeing how many interrupts happen in the meantime. And then it tells you when interrupts were last enabled and disabled, and software IRQs last enabled and disabled. This is very useful in cases where uh, interrupts got enabled by mistake and you're trying to find out where the bug is. On the next slide, we just see the, the dump for the other side of the race, which is a read. The previous one's a write. Uh, stack trace is similar. Uh, and we have a similar set of things for the hard IQs and soft IRQs and the IRQ stamp. And then it tells us uh, the CPU, the PID, the name of the thing, and uh, gives us some information about uh, the, the kernel. And it also some information about the hardware, which in this case, it was RCU torture running, so it's QMU. So that's an example splat and what you can get from it. Um, that can be a lot more useful than having something strange happen and trying to figure out, you know, why is this strange stuff happening? It tells you, by the way, did you know this read and write are happening at the same variable at the same time? Uh, and if that wasn't intended, you can track it down easily. We can also do it the other way. I mentioned earlier that you can encode design rules uh, and tell BPF about your concurrency design rules. And here is how you do that. Okay, there's something called assert exclusive access. So if you have a situation where you believe there can be no racing accesses to this variable, you say assert exclusive access in the name of the variable. And then if there is an access, a read or a write on some other thread or an interrupt, it'll yell at you. Okay, so it helps you, it helps flag violations of your design rules where the design rules are specified by assert exclusive access. There are, of course, some cases where it's just fine for people to be reading, but 
it's a problem if somebody else is doing a racing update. And for that, we have ex a certain exclusive writer. And that will not complain about reads, but it'll complain if there's another write. So if you believe that uh, this piece of code is the only thing you should be updating this variable at this time, throw a certain exclusive writer in there. And again, KCSAN will, will yell at you if that design rule is violated. OK, um, and kind of a which is which kind of a thing. Uh, we have these two tools. We have the Linux kernel memory model, which uses HERD7 as a tool, and we have kernel concurrency sanitizer. And uh, as always with these things, it depends. Uh, the Linux kernel memory model is very thorough. It does the moral equivalent of a full state space search. All right. So uh, if a race could potentially happen in geologic time, Linux kernel memory model is going to find it. All right. Uh, KC SAN is only going to detect problems that actually occur in testing or that nearly occur. It does some tricks so that nearby reads and writes get detected. But you have to at least give it a near miss for it to notice that there was a race. It detects races that happen. Uh, unlike KC, uh, LKMM, it does not detect potential races. Um, LKMM, you got to hand translate and you're very restricted. The, the Your litmus tests have to be small. I mean, we're doing an exhaustive full state space search. On a good day, that's merely combinatorial explosion. On a bad day, it's undecidable, OK? So LKMM is doing something very hard, and you have to get a very small uh, little program fragments for it to be able to do its job. KCSAN, on the other hand, takes the whole kernel very happily, eats the whole thing, um, and also deals with things like unbounded loops, function calls, interrupts, and all those other things. Uh, those can be emulated in LKMM uh, at a cost of uh, analysis time. Um, and both of them have different ways of checking for complex conditions. So uh, if, if you want a sound bite for which to use, I would argue that Linux kernel memory model is a design time tool for checking the core concurrency design of your code. KC SAN is useful for regression testing. You've got the whole thing, it's there. You can run tests every week or every day or whatever, and it'll check everything for you at that time. Uh, whereas uh, trying to run Linux kernel memory model on your code every week is going to mean a lot of hand translation. OK, uh, that's uh, that's kind of the introduction. Uh, I'd be open to any thoughts. Uh, 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 one thing, I guess I'll kick it off with a question to you guys. Um, I took a look through the test code uh, for the BPF lib style uh, BPF programs. And it looked like the user space components were mostly doing control setting at the beginning and then reading things out. Um, and that's kind of nice in the sense that the concurrency of that is restricted and easy to handle. Uh, so I put the question out, what kind of concurrency models do we have for the user space components? My, my guess is sooner or later we'll get into the full up where it's, where it's doing closed loop control all the time. But I figure should, I should ask where, what, where we are now and where we're going. Any thoughts on that? Uh, please turn your camera on, unmute yourself, and all that. If uh... Come on, I know some of you guys are not on Pacific time, okay? Of course, I know some of you are on even more disadvantaged time zones, but uh, here we are. Okay, um, uh, any questions or thoughts on other topics? Or do we have a, a fair amount of time we're giving back to people, which is okay too, I suppose. Paul, I think it wasn't clear to me, at least, whether this is the last slide and you're really opening up for the <clears throat> discussion or... Oh, yes, this is the last slide. I should have said that. This we've I've gone through the material, so it's discussion time. All right. Um, and uh, the other option is if, the, if I've blasted through something too quickly, um, please feel free to tell me to go back uh, and to go through it more carefully. That's that's legit too. 
obviously. Well, I had a question about the exclusive, uh, assert exclusive uh, access. So it looks like the only the exclu assert exclusive writer is used by the kernel, and whereas the assert exclusive access is only for the. Oh no! Yeah, I found it in RCU. So yeah, RCU is the only user of this, right? Oh, I was the one that requested it, so that might have something to do with it. But yes, uh, yeah, uh, RCU does use both of them. Uh, and it's been useful to me because there have been times when I thought I had gotten exclusive access in my design and coding, but hadn't quite, right? Right. So I was just thinking how this uh, primitives can be used from the VPF side. So all the maps, all the maps data is uh, potentially can be shared and racy. Uh, I guess we can have a special helper in some way to mark this kind of access with this primitives. But I haven't looked at the implementation. Do the guards, uh, like reads and writes are happening as a special instruction? So what's the details of the implementations here? Um, I'm going to give you my take on it. Uh, uh, unfor unfortunately, I, was, I didn't uh, think ahead and get Marco involved, and they scheduled him for a conflicting talk. So he can't be here until maybe the last five minutes. But uh, what happens? is that uh, the kernel concurrency sanitizer when it sees a potentially racy access it uh it flags that internally and uh it also uh randomly will do a bit of spinning to consume to open up the race window okay and during that time it checks for similar instrumentation in the other threads the other tasks other cpus and uh, complains if there's a collision if uh, it sees the same address uh, an overlap, if you will, between the two accesses. And so uh, its normal approach is just to instrument the reads and writes in that manner. And what you're doing with a third exclusive access is you're not actually doing an access uh, in instructions, but you're saying, okay, uh, uh, are there, you're just asking the question, are there other accesses? That's exclusive, third exclusive access. So it does the same thing as if you had done an access. But instead of doing the access, it just does the the random occasional wait uh, spin, and it does the checking on the other threads to see if that variable is being either accessed in the case of assert exclusive access, or uh, written in the case of assert exclusive writer. And I believe that uh, Marco has plans for additional uh, scoped things where you can, uh, and uh, maybe these are in by now. I should have I should have asked him, but uh, there are plans for making things say from here to here. Um, there better not be a uh, an access or uh, a write to this variable. So um, in some of the BPF programs, uh, there are shared variables. Uh, and uh, one approach would be to make a certain exclusive writer and exclude a certain assert exclusive access uh, available to the uh, BPF code for this, uh, to allow the, the writer, uh, the developer of that code to uh, do similar uh, sorts of things. Would that make sense? Yeah, that uh, makes complete sense to me, especially now we have a BTF tag facility on the LLVM side, so we can just, instead of using the macros, we can probably just annotate those uh, variables and regions of memory as exclusive access, and the rest of the infra verifier in the JIT will do the right thing, whatever is appropriate. Cool. Yeah, that would. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, ease of use is even better, right? Cool. Uh, uh, Paul, I'm not sure you have a, a chat open. There are a few questions in the oh. chat. Or no, I can I don't. let me let me fix that. Go ahead. Uh, why don't you pick the ones that are the? It's, it's taking forever to. It's giving this little circle spinning. So why don't you pick them out and ask them in, in that way? So Will is asking: Does exposing the kernel memory model? We have BPF mean that we are unable to relax it in the future for fear of breaking existing BPF programs. Um, I'll give an answer to that, uh, a prototype answer. Obviously, you know, your BPF guys are, are own this, but my suggestion would be to treat it the same as a kernel module. If the if the BPF program is in the kernel, then if we change the memory model in such a way that the code needs to change, we change it. If the BPF program is external and there is any kind of change in the kernel, 
You know, in other words, we got a BPF program's out of tree, and there's any change in the kernel, be it memory model or anything else, it's the responsibility of whoever's maintaining it out of tree to modify it as needed for new versions of the kernel. So that's my prototype, that's my suggestion. And obviously you guys own the uh, thing. Um, and Marco points out, I uh, finally it, it got it up here. Marco points out, thank you, Marco, uh, that um, uh, sort of exclusive assets is using K-free uh, to detect uh, use after freeze, which is kind of cool, uh, but it does it indirectly. Um, okay, and uh, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I saw quite, oh, Eric, Eric Doomsday, okay. Uh, I, saw, I saw a question and I couldn't find it again. Uh, what's the scope of assert exclusive access and list splice RCU? Uh, if you just, just using assert exclusive access and exclusive, assert exclusive writer gives you point-wise scope. I mean, just right there at that point, it's checking. Um, it kind of opens up the window randomly. Obviously, if it opened the window all the time, you'd be painfully slow, but at random points, it randomly chooses to open or not. And if it opens, it'll there'll be a time period, but the time period is still, you know, in, at that point in code. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to type to Marco uh, 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 asking about the scope uh, approach. Is there to be a scoped um, assert exclusive? Okay, and uh, hopefully that'll get there. Um, and uh, Will just, uh, 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 Will likes my prototype response. Uh, Lawrence uh, says, could, how could we write BPF that works across multiple memory models then? Okay, and, and uh, so um, what I assumption is you've got a user space code that is trying to use, say, the C++ memory model or the C memory model, and you want it to interact with the kernel. Um, and uh, I would say that if you have a BPF program user space components interacting directly with the kernel, it's going to have to uh, adapt. It's going to have to know that it's dealing with the Linux kernel memory model in those interactions. Um, and so the uh, one way to make it easy would be to have a full memory barrier. I mean, you could either use the Linux kernel model SMPMB equivalent in user space code, or you could put in something like a, uh, a uh, uh, memory fence, uh, a, 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 a memory thread fence. I've got the name wrong, I'm sorry, but the uh, thing there and give it a, uh, an SC memory fence. And Marco said that we've already got ex assert exclusive scope. Thank you, Marco, great. And so Eric, um, if you want to make a larger scope, Marco's already got it for you. So we're good there. And uh, okay, uh, if I miss somebody, somebody yell. I'm just gonna go through them again uh, as I see them. So we got, uh, then we got Kumar uh, asking other plans to support consume control dependence in BPF MM. Uh, some build-in with Clegg front end and verifier uh, recognize such accesses. Uh, that'd be a wonderful thing. Uh, one of the things that uh, needs to happen is to make it so that we have, uh, and control dependencies, both uh, control dependencies, that would make a shameful plug for uh, Will's, mostly Will's, also mine, Peter's, and John Oglev's, uh talk on, I think it's Friday, uh, about uh, uh, the uh, control dependencies. Well, we'll talk about those. Uh, the address and data dependencies, um, uh, the consumed dependencies would be their address or data dependencies. And uh, we have proposals in the standards committee to handle those. And uh, one of the things I need to do is get my act together and come up with some way of prototyping them in real compilers. We had a G GSOC student uh, a couple of years ago who got a good start. Um, the uh, difficulty is that the that what you're having to do with these things is suppress, uh, you know, selectively suppress optimizations. And uh, the optimizations are kind of pervasive, especially in GCC, which has a uh, interesting architecture, uh, uh, courtesy of uh, Richard Stallman. So uh, that's a general problem. It's not just BPF, it's everybody. And 
uh, I need to make better progress on uh, on dealing with that. But it's a great question. Gotham, uh, is it possible to vert some of the asserted loss of exclusive assets writers conditions in the BPF user code uh, to an exist condition and do a state space search for the BPF user code? Um, and uh, given the BPF user code expect to have bounded state space, can we use that to our advantage for full form of verification? Um, quite possibly. Uh, one of the uh, projects that's kind of been in uh, halfway done state for a long time is to analyze the primitives used by a given architecture in the Linux kernel and uh, look at them, compare the hardware model for that given architecture, the hardware, uh, formal hardware memory model, to the LKMM and make a determination if the primitives are sufficient. And this is uh, not an easy thing and it's been kind of uh, going along slowly. Uh, but in general, anything we can do to automatically convert things is great. The one um, limitation we'd have to be careful of is that uh, is that uh, you can easily create something that's way bigger than uh, Herd 7 can deal with. Again, Herd 7 is doing a very difficult thing. It's doing a full state space search, complete everything. Uh, and it's, you know, if you give it too much stuff to look through, it's never going to get done. But uh, uh, so I would guess that another thing that would be important for that approach would be some sort of slicer where you could say, okay, here are the parts I really care about and have it automatically generate for you. And that would be, that'd be cool. A similar thing might be possible, uh, be really cool by looking at the worn ons and bugs and uh, other um, complaints, you know, uh, uh, assertions in the Linux kernel and, you know, having some kind of automated help to, uh, to create a memory, a, a litmus test, a LKMM litmus test from that code. Again, uh, slicing of some sort would be really important uh, to, in order to make sure that the litmus test was uh, sufficiently small. So a good question. So that's some good discussion. Uh, other other thoughts, other aspects that uh, need to be need some consideration. Uh, one thing I'd like to, I mean, Will, uh, on the previous question about the uh, change to the memory model and the BPF programs, um, uh, Will seconded my suggestion, but then of course, on the other hand, Will is, is uh, one of the LKM maintainers and a core kernel guy. Uh, so we, we definitely would tend that way. Uh, any thoughts from the, uh, from BPF folk on, uh, on uh, the status of out of tree BPF programs? Uh, again, the proposal is if you have an out of tree BPF program, you need to look at each kernel uh, revision. In other words, if if you move from, I don't know, 5.14 to 5.17 sometime in the future, uh, you need to look at the kernel and see what changed, um, uh, if anything, uh, and and update your BPF program accordingly. Is that is that uh, reasonable? If it's not reasonable, what uh, can be done to to help people? You know, is it, would there be, go ahead. I can try to answer. Uh, I think it very much it would be a default assumption for many already, mainly because that's a state of tracing world right now. When things uh, depend on the kernel, they do break from time to time, and people do have to adjust their BPF programs all the time from kernel version to kernel version. In tracing, that happens pretty much every release. So LKMM changing from one release to another, though unlikely, if it ever happens, well, yeah, the folks will have to adjust. And uh, one thing I suppose it became too much of a problem, if there ends up being tons and tons of BPF code out there, perhaps something like the printf change recently. Uh, maybe there could be something that looks at a program and gives you suggestions about what might need to be adjusted. Well, Eastern, we'll, so I'm not volunteering to do it. Yeah, so we were saying that it could be subtle and hardware dependent breakage. That's, well, uh, certainly true. 
Uh, but that's also true. I mean, if uh, if somebody were to put some, I don't, I don't think I, I don't think they would. But if they were to put some uh, trace point, uh, a BPF trace point on some internal function within RCU, and I have to redesign it, the function goes away. I mean, that's that's life already. Oh, well, that one's easy to check for. <laughs> I think the extending cases on to cover jitted programs it would be the good enough solution that will cover all of this majority of the subtle subtle breakages mm -hmm. right now with the we're not there and actually my question was uh if i understood your presentation that's pr the teaching jit to how call into cases on public apis for this read write is the only thing that is necessary right so it will handle the races between one program access and shared memory and another BPF program, just like the race between BPF program and the kernel. Am That's I... right. That's mm -hmm. right. The the only thing that's kind of uh, difficult at this point is would be races with the user space components. Uh, so, for example, there's a uh, there's one that that, from what I can tell, does it right. What it does, the user space component says, "Hey, here's my PID," and just stores it um, using the uh, the uh, now I forget what it's called, but there's a there's a data structure that's generated by the BPF system. Right. So uh, it I think, I think it's, back, it's back to the Lawrence question of mixing uh, different memory models, the user yes. space and the kernel difference. So we have this uh, problem already, and two ways of communicating between BPF and user space: the perforating buffer and the BPF ring buffer. The folk certainly goes through this. Uh, concurrency issues. That's why we have all the primitives ready for user space and the uh, best practices of how to use the string buffers. So so let me uh, ask a question. I apologize for my ignorance of BPF uh, as usual. Uh, but it looked like the user space program was just doing a store and that that was reflected in the kernel. Was I misreading the code and it's actually going through the ring buffer somehow? Depends. Uh, Maps would be just direct load store, mm -hmm. just a load source actually. Then the ring buffer, you know, well, depends again. Like the perf ring buffer will do a copy, where well, depends and <laughs> depends okay. on the context. And the, the ring buffer will be just a direct write into the well, share. the ring. The ring buffer is easy because it has to be fully synchronized. Right? Yes, so that's. Yeah, I know Andre put a lot of effort into making sure it was fully right. synchronized. Uh, so that one's good. I mean, so if we're using the ring buffer, uh, then the question becomes uh, an easy one, which is anytime you use the ring buffer, it's fully synchronized, and that ring buffer then provides the interface between whatever user space memory model you're using and the Linux kernel memory model. If there are, if 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 I wasn't misreading the code, and there really are cases where the user space just goes and stores into something that the kernel can just directly read. And it can do. You can do that. You you map it, right? You do an map, and there you are. You got memory that's shared between kernel and user. <laughs> that can happen. <laughs> it's it's supported. Um, uh, then uh, then the question becomes uh, uh, more um, interesting. And to Brendan's uh, follow up, uh, the thing is, if we change the memory model, it's not just BPF programs that are getting hurt. We have to look at the kernel, right? <laughs> 35 million lines of it, or whatever it is this year. Uh, so uh, believe me, you're, you're not alone in the, in the subtle breakage. That's uh, if we're going to change the memory model, we're going to be very, very careful how we do it for that reason. Uh, but probably not careful enough. That's life. So uh, let's see. Paul says that uh, outside tracing and will reinforces that the breakage is going to be difficult. Uh, Paul Sheng Yong uh, suggests that outside tracing doesn't happen often. Um, and uh, and there's very large programs might have complexity issues. Uh, very large programs might be some things that are being proposed to interact with Linux kernel networking and scheduler potentially. And BPF initializations happens before object load, he says. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's a window issue. Okay. And um, by the way, Marco is is uh, here. And so, um, actually, if if we have if people are interested, uh, uh, Marco mentioned that there was a assert exclusive scoped. Um, 
uh, would uh, would you be willing just to say how that works, Marco? Hi, can there you we hear go. me? Yes. I can hear you. Very good. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that was also part of the first KC Sun uh, release. And basically, what it does, similar to the normal um, KC Sun, so the assert exclusive, um, basically, it just starts checking an access for the entire duration of a scope. And uh, you just use it like, I guess, similar to the other assert exclusive, but you add it at the start of a function, for example. Then it will check um, the access provided to the macro until the end of the very function. And uh, you can think of it a bit like uh, like simulated reordering of an access, which is actually how I'm planning to implement um, modeling weak memory with KC set, which is not yet um, in mainline. But hopefully, I'll send the patches for that soon. Thank you. Look forward to seeing those patches. That'd be really cool. Um, it's probably someplace in RCU I should use something like that, although I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I bet there is. I bet that. Uh, so let me let me ask a question. If I were to say acquire a lock, and then release the lock, can I just put a curly brace right after the lock acquisition and a closed curly brace right before the lock release, and then do a scoped access across that and have that say this thing had better not change during this critical section? Uh, yes, you can do that. Oh, but okay. I bet I can I find some use for that. Cool. I think uh, like if you wait for the changes that introduce modeling weak memory, I don't think you even have to do that. So any access within the critical section will just be considered for simulated reordering automatically, unless it's say a release uh, SMP store release or something like that. Okay. So to the example again, what you're telling me is with the new patches. Um, just the fact I acquired the lock and released it, if I didn't have any memory barriers inside of this thing, it would just automatically scope all the accesses. Yes. That'd be really cool. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, uh, scheduling is an issue here, but uh, I'm glad Marco can make it. We have a couple minutes left. Um, Bouchon uh, mentions that... Uh, uh, he doesn't think we're going to relax the memory bottle, and, and I have to agree with it, with him completely on that. Uh, almost all the agitation at this point is to strengthen the memory model. The cool thing about that is if uh, uh, there are some weird corner cases that academics have come up with, okay? But as a general rule, if you strengthen the memory model, whatever worked before works afterwards, um, give or take some very strange corner cases. So uh, hopefully that makes uh, for less concern. I, the place you get in trouble there uh, is if you create a, a uh, BPF program for the new version that has a strong memory model, then try to backport it, okay? So um, the advice would be uh, to write the BPF program and debug on the oldest version you're ever gonna use it on and forward port it if uh, memory model issues were of concern. And Lorentz uh, mentions that uh, versioning the memory model from BPF side might make sense. In other words, every time we change it, uh, note that and then have the verifier give a warning, which, yeah, that uh, especially if we had some change that weakened it. I, I, I don't see Linus accepting any change that weakened the memory model, given his uh, stance in the past. But if he did, uh, that would be a great way to uh, help with that. So that's a good idea. Thank you, Lorentz. Anyway, uh, any other questions, thoughts, concerns? I'm not too confused. We're right at the end of time. So if there are no further questions or thoughts, uh, of course, there are. Uh, feel free to email myself, uh, Marco, or, or any of the BTF guys, or maybe all of us. Uh, and thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, hopefully, uh, this is uh, KC Sands as useful to you guys as it has been to me. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Paul, so much for, for presenting. <coughs>